Welcome back, folks, to Two Brits, One Puck. I'm your host, Mr. Intangibles, and the Blair Boy, Dan Masters, with my good friend, a man who likes to read the rule book, and a man who's scared of ships. Will Everett Human, Will, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. You, you sound pretty dour, Dan. I'm not going to lie. You sound, you're not as chirpy as you normally are, which is... Yeah, I, th- I think you've given me your lurgy over the airwaves, somehow. It's called a computer virus, mate. Look it up. But the worst thing is for me is, I don't know why, but coughs and colds just knock me on my arse. I've never, ever been able to deal with them. I can, like I've said before, I believe I've had numerous concussions in my life undiagnosed and I've just kind of popped back up, got back on with it. I once sliced my leg open on a piece of tile when I was redecorating our house Whoa. down to underneath the fat layer oh, for... and it was bleeding like an absolute mother. And all I did was I put my leg under a boiling hot tap and then put a giant plaster on it. And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'll, I'll be okay. Well, I'm but not... colds, I just want to lie in bed for a week. One of those ones that you just unroll. And it's like a, you know, the, do you know the ones where it's like a strip of the plastery bit down the middle, and you just unroll it like a loo roll and cut off as much. as you Yeah, can. it was exactly like that. And I just pinched this massive cut together and just basically gaffer taped my leg up. And I, st- I still have a massive scar now down my leg because oh. I never got it. I should probably should have had stitches or something. No, I, I, I wonder why. Whatever. I wonder why you've got such a big scar on. Yeah. On that. Dad, but coughs and colds, I am the stereotypical, oh, he's got the man flu. I am stereotypical man flu man when it comes to stuff like that. And that was going to be my, my question. How do you feel about the term man flu? Oh, well, clearly, well, I am more ill than any man has ever been ever. So I, I believe I deserve sympathy from you and our listeners. As much as it's meant to, to belittle men as a whole and our supposed ability to deal with things that the, other, the fairer sex can't, can kind of subtly promotes that idea of of masculinity of like oh you know yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you're a real man you don't feel ill you just crack on and that links back into the whole societal thing of oh you shouldn't feel ill because you have to work your employer needs you therefore you're not allowed to ever feel ill that's my rant on man flu this week dan thanks for coming i per- <laughs> don't forget to tip your waitress good night i poo-pooed the idea of work needing me a long time ago and i just if i'm ill i'm just staying off i don't oh, care man. sorry it's it's fucking because i criminal. everyone has this idea that work needs them for some reason no if you left they just replace you the next day they don't care they don't care at all as we both climb cool. down off yeah. our soapboxes <laughs> <laughs> excellent i do not have a question of the week but i do have something i wanted to talk to you about and it's not hockey related so if you want to skip the uh, first part of this show people who are just have to have all hockey news and nothing but hockey news i understand Mate, but it's, it's too late for that we've just done however many minutes on man flu and, and <laughs> it's a fair point and your yeah but you never know to your employer. <laughs> you never know but uh i i went and saw parasite on tuesday oh, so, so i heard so did did, did you like it or it's one of the most unbelievable th- films I've ever seen. I'm. This, this is going to sound completely artsy fartsy, and I don't know what the word is, but it moved me. Will I've not been moved by a film like that for about twenty years. Did it you... was absolutely unbelievable. I implore everybody to go and see Parasite. I don't care if you're not used to if you're not used to subtitles or whatever. Fucking grow up. You can't read and watch something at the same time. <laughs> fucking have a word with yourself. It's twenty twenty. Crying out loud. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And it's joined my list of perfect films. I think I might be watching it this weekend, as my darling wife has, has shown an interest. Um, Make sure you do. Do not read anything about it. Don't be spoiled. Try to go in as blind as possible. You have to. I know I know the rough idea about it. Not not like the plot, but like the the overarching theme and the message. But I don't yeah, think and there's no, spo- no spoilers from me, but it's basically... A family who's down and out, they get their son to go and work for a family who's done very well for themselves. That's all I'll say. Okay. Yeah, my, my understanding and, but, is it's, it's very in-fitting with the, the workers' rights. It is, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. I, I believe that this film will be studied for decades. Along the kind of Citizen Kane, Psycho, One Full of the Cuckoo's Nest. God. Parasite will be on, well, it is on this list, without question. I, I believe I've seen six perfect films. This is now number seven. And I hadn't seen one of them for, well, 2002, I think, was the last time I saw a film that I thought was perfect. So Well, you can't you can't just say that and not list the six. It appears Quite my well. fishing sentence has worked, as I was hoping you'd, I was hoping you'd ask me that question. <laughs> well, I'm, it's funny, I, I wasn't prepared for this question at all, Will. Yeah. What, what else are your... Are your 
perfect films. If you haven't watched one since 2002, what came out in 2002? Spider-Man 1, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. <laughs> um, You're not going to get the last film I saw that I believe was perfect because it was another Korean film and it was Old Boy. Oh, uh, uh, no, I probably wouldn't have guessed it, but Old Boy is incredible. Yeah. Not, um... And then I've also got... <laughs> I was thinking, you're never going to guess. This is like no clues or anything. Just guess which, guess which films I like, Will. It's, yeah. like, it's an impossible which, question. Well, I'd, I'd imagine that they're fairly, you know, it's not going to be bloody, oh, uh, it's a 12-minute uh, short film by Polish director. <laughs> Don't forget, Robert though, Lewandowski. I'm, a film studies, I'm a film studies student. I've seen a lot of films and a lot of weird shit in my time. Is, it, is one of them Uchien Andalou? <laughs> no. If it's not Mildred Pierce, I'm not interested because that's the only perfect bit of cinema that's ever been created. Let me rattle off the list for you. Go on. In no me. in no order. So in no on. order. Old so, Boy as one of them. What are the other five? Old Boy, Psycho. Okay. Vertigo. Is that another Hitchcock? Yeah. Seven. Okay. Yeah. Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. yeah. And this is the outlier. Oh God. But I'll stand. I'll stand by it. Finding Predator. Nemo. Predator. You <laughs> think? Fuck off. You cannot. <coughs> oh, you've killed me with that take. You cannot look me in the theoretical eye and tell me you think Predator is a perfect film. I absolutely can. You're, I think it's perfect. You're incorrect. That's just nonsense. Do you know what? Do you know what all of those films have in common? And actually, Parasite as well. You think it's one thing, but it's something completely different. And even when it does a complete one eighty. It still makes sense, and you still go, oh, "Okay, yeah, I can, I can kind of see what's happening here what, now. I get that." Oh well, the the fact that it goes from we're hunting to being hunted is the is the one eighty. Yeah, the films. Yeah, Predator start again. It's nineteen. What when was Predator made? Nineteen eighty eight or something? If you've not seen Predator, spoiler alert. If you're not familiar, on with Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger and his friends are a rescue team sent to this South American jungle to find this ambassador to rescue him. Then it turns out there's an alien hunting them through the jungle. And then it becomes a game of cat and mouse. When the film starts, you have no idea that's what's going to happen. And it's hard now because certain films have been ruined or spoiled. So if you already know the twist in Psycho, then it's ruined. If you already know what Predator is, it's ruined. But when you saw it for the first time, which I did, I, you know, because I'm, obviously I'm old. So I saw Predator about a year after it was released on, on video. I was completely blown away by it because I had no idea what was going to happen. But was there not... This is where, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I can't put myself in that time because I wasn't there, but like, I'd have thought that Predator would be fairly obvious what it's about. It wasn't. It wasn't at the time. There was no, there's no online reviews. There's no film... Ma- well, there, was, there might have been film magazines, but I wasn't reading them. Surely it was just a trailer in the old cinema, though, wouldn't you? I'm not that old. <laughs> well, that... I saw Predator when I was like 10. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly so and that's yeah that's why all right yeah but just because you at 10 years old didn't know what predator was about that's not that's not a you know it's like a stand-up testimony for for the general understanding that grown adults had of predator at the time i agree i didn't say i didn't say this is a list of perfect films and i've canvassed every single person in the history of the universe i just said this is my list of perfect films I, and I, I think I predator is on, on that the, list on the twist side of it i reckon if Predator came out today, if it had never come out and it came out today, even disregarding the whole digital age sort of shit, I reckon there's a fair understanding that, oh, okay. Because you can't tell me there was a trainer for Predator that dressed it up as solely a rescue mission. I, I don't know. I don't know. And I, I didn't. I mean, maybe if I go back and look at trailers now, maybe, yeah, maybe they give it away. But when I saw it, I still think it's a film that holds up for that reason. Is it starts out as one thing, it completely flips... And then even after it's flip, the flip makes some kind of sense and it's still good. Yeah, it's a good film. No no question in that. That's always the one that people freak out over when I give them my list. Yeah, I know that's why I always save it till the end. Because the rest of them are like, I don't know, I'm, I'm hesitant to call the films intelligent or whatever because that's always just a fucking nonsense thing to say about a film anyway. But Predator is the outlier. You know what this is, don't you? <laughs> what, what is it? This is one of those things where I give you my opinion and then you spend the next five minutes trying to tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like your wife does you do all the time. That seems, hey, that's not... <laughs> where have you heard this? Yeah, I don't know. That, that's slander. Slander of the, of the highest order. Fucking hell. All right, should we get into hockey news? Yeah, we should. <laughs> Fucking hell. Pissed off now. All right, everybody, go and see Parasite. <laughs>
Hey everybody, it's that time of the week. It is the Smooth Recap. I like to champion those who put the work in, and you always need those guys who fill out the roster, and they need love too. So shout out to Anthony Beauvillier, who is on the longest point streak of his career. It currently stands at six games. Matt Kachuk is now officially the only player who's allowed to score between the legs goals. Take a bow, son. The old game show adage is points means prizes. In the NHL, points means Norris's. And John Carlson is leading the charge as he ties his career season high in goals with 15. Mark Stone is unsurprisingly setting records for the Vegas Golden Knights becoming the first player in franchise history to have a five-point regular season game. When a NASA spaceship comes back to Earth, everyone has to haul ass to recover the vehicle. This is like hockey, as the race for the rocket is picking up. The ever-changing scoring lead now sees David Pasternak sit atop the standings alone, with 41 goals. The Arizona Coyotes have been caught illegally testing draft-eligible players at least 20 times and are now being formally investigated by the NHL. That's a bit of a... howler. One of those fun Wayne Gretzky stats now. With David Pasternak's hat-trick, he and Alexander Ovechkin are the only active players with nine career hat-tricks before their 24th birthday. Gretzky had 36. Lol. Speaking of the Oilers, Leon Draisaitl scored four points in the first Oilers game post-McDavid injury, and we can officially add Connor to the trade deadline trade bait list. Rumours of Kerry Price's dalliances outside of his marriage have been levelled at him for a long time from the Montreal media. He does his case no favours, as against the Leafs, he produces a double knob save. Big Billy Guerin has sent out a warning to his players, declaring that players who don't try will be traded. Thanks for the easy out, Bill. And that was your smooth recap. Gretzky stats, always fantastic. 36 hat-tricks before his 24th birthday. It's fucking mental, isn't it? <laughs> and the next best of any player now is nine. Oh, fucking ridiculous. The the one that shocked me that's been floating around recently with the whole OV challenging his record thing. Have you seen all about sixty goal seasons and like the age players were when they had their last sixty goal season? No, but it's players like Gretzky, Lemieux, Phil Esposito, Timo Solani, and stuff like that. And Wayne Gretzky's last sixty goal season came when he was twenty six years old, which is pretty crazy if you ask me. Yeah, that is crazy. Current record, I think, is I think it's Esposito at thirty two, who is the the oldest sixty goal season. But yeah, to hear that, so like you know Solani and and the Mew and everyone else has has had done it later in their career than than Gretzky had done, which is obviously you know thirty six hat tricks before your twenty fourth birthday is just mental. To see Gretzky that low on on a record that you'd assume him to have was a uh, yeah pretty shocking. Just quickly, what do you think about this Arizona Coyotes thing? Oh, mate, like I, I, it's all a bit sort of technicalities and 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 legalese and stuff. Like I, I, I get that's what I thought. I get it because the whole point is, it's not to exude too much pressure on on these young kids and like for the teams to not just abuse the power that they have over them, sort of thing. Like, yeah, you know, say you're playing a busy busy OHL season or whatever, and you're still technically meant to be going to school, is the idea. Then you've got every NHL team in the league phoning you up every other week, like, oh, sure, do get on the bike for us, do a little VO2 max, let us, you know, do, do a naughty little bleep <laughs> test, let us see, see where you're at. Like, it's just not, it's to protect these players that don't really have a, a lot of protection as it is because they're on the right team. It's not like the worst crime in the world, but it's still bad. Like, they still shouldn't be doing it. So, it's a bit telling tales out of school, but they shouldn't be doing it, should they? I've got an algebra yeah. test at three, keep running. The anecdote is because they can meet with the players. Yes, Shaker can go to dinner with them or whatever. But it's like, oh yeah, let's go for dinner. Bring your, uh, yeah, bring your drive for it. <laughs> bring your, bring your joggers. Like, <laughs> bring your gym stuff. Bring like, a dumbbell. <laughs> if you could bring a stopwatch as well, mate, that'd be useful. <laughs> bring, bring a stationary bike if you don't mind. It's it's not a very salacious crime though, is it? It's not very, <laughs> not very interesting. Nah, no. 
Who cares if a, if a bunch of kids got abused? Whatever. It's the coyotes as well. <laughs> yeah, they've clearly not got any fucking advantage out of it. I've just let them carry on. I was going to say, it's not like it's helped them. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Okay, who is winning the cup? Dan, you know who's winning the cup this week? It's me. I'm winning the oh, cup. No way. I am, I am. It's funny that. Do you remember last week when we were talking about a certain team in, in red and black that I absolutely hate? Not Man United. It was the Chicago Blackhawks. <laughs> yes. And I specifically said Mark Lazarus was a tit for saying they were back in the race. And Dan, do you know where they are in the standings now? In the Central Division standings, by any chance? I'm going to take a wild stab in the dark and guess lower than they were last week. Oh, yeah. Conversation. Oh, yeah. Can't get much lower, Dan, because they are bottom of the division. And, oh, there we go. And Big Willie Styles right yet again. Congratulations, me. Big Willie Mystic Meg over there. Fantastic. <laughs> Wistic Weg. <laughs> Winning the wag, you know. Winning the cup for me is we all like a feel good story. It's Ilya Kovalchuk. He's been rejuvenated. He's putting up some points for the Habs. Now better teams are now sniffing around, <laughs> looking at him as a, a little bit of a lower down scoring option. Now he seems to be finding the back of the net and picking up a few points. I enjoyed him. I enjoyed him shushing the Devils fans who were giving him jip all night. Oh, and did you see that video he put out of him murking his kids, which was fucking hilarious? Uh, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, very underdressed for the weather. I just said. Mr. Kovalchuk was. He wasn't wasn't wearing a thick enough coat for me. He is Russian. It's probably warm to so, him. He probably, he probably still feels cold though, doesn't he? Nah, Russian men, are, they're made of sterner stuff. <laughs> just made of absolute. Yeah they're, yeah, they're just made of sterner stuff, aren't they? That's a fantastic... One of the best things about having kids is the fact that you can do that kind of thing to them. I mean, generally. Do you reckon Conor McDavid's <coughs> dad can do that to him? I was going to say maybe when he was five, but probably nah. not then either. No. I, I reckon... I reckon... Connor was deking out his dad as soon as he got on the skates. Well, that was it. He's deking out the uh, deking out the midwife. <laughs> <laughs> the midwife's got a... Uh, oh, God. I'm sorry, Mrs. McDavid, but I've got to make this joke. The midwife's got a hand inside Mrs. McDavid. She's like, oh, God, I can't find him. Where's he gone? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> He's eluding the demon. <laughs> Defences are now thinking the same thing. <laughs> Driving, having the sonogram is like, sorry, he just won't stop doing spinorama, so I can't, <laughs> can't keep up with him. <laughs> Right, who's getting relegated? Uh, the Flyers are getting relegated, Dan. Did you hear what happened uh, in their game against the Devils the other day? I did not. Go on. Ooh. Or maybe I did, but I've just forgotten. Love it. So, Flyers, Devils. Don't know where it was. Don't care where it was, but it was the Flyers and the Devils. Shot clock red. New Jersey, 18. Philadelphia, 46. Any uh, hazard a guess at the scoreline, Dan? Well, I'm going to guess the Devils won then. Oh, yeah. 5 2 nil. Nil to the New Jersey Five. Devils. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god you love to see it you absolutely you live to see it I'd say that's just, that's everything I'm here for 46 shots that's and you a, get a um, shout out that's fucked that's up a, that's a hockey ultimate team score line that is <laughs> <laughs> you just batter some absolute no mark and he just wins somehow and you just like that's it this game's bullshit it's scripted I'm turning it off so says the bitter man who's absolutely shit at ultimate team <laughs> oh god yeah I'm completely bitter but that's why I don't play it anymore <laughs> Who have you got relegated then? Unfortunately, this might become a weekly segment of why I'm going to relegate the San Jose Sharks. But oh, excellent. they lost heavily to the Calgary Flames in midweek. Would you like to know, Will, some of the Flames scorers on that night? Oh, I, I do remember three of them, but please enjoy your moment to enlighten those who might not be uh, as in the know. So the San Jose Sharks lost. I mean, combined spend on D... What's the salary cap? Eight one and a half million. Yeah, and their decor cost about sixty. Something. I mean, Somewhere I might be rounding up a little give, bit there, but it's around take. there. Yeah. Noted flame scrolls on that night were Mark Jankowski, Milan Lucci. Nothing wrong with Mark Jankowski. I mean, Milan Lucci is former four thirty goal scorer. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Stanley Cup winner, obviously. Stanley Cup winner. Zach Ronaldo, <laughs> the the footballer. Y- yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Brazilian superstar, and Toby Reader. <laughs> Reader, of course, a man famed for scoring so few goals, he was publicly called out by Bob Nicholson while he was in Edmonton. Didn't he, didn't he <laughs> score no goals last year? Did he end on zero? Yeah, he's got no goals. No. And Bob Nicholson basically said, if it wasn't for Toby Reader, we'd be in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd completely <laughs> forgotten about that. You forgot about that? <laughs> Fuck you, Toby, it's all your fault. <laughs> Yeah, it's all. We had a big, we had a, yeah, we had a segment on that. Oh, it was, it's all I remember coming, it being quite funny. It's all coming back to me. Oh, dear me. I've got to, I'm going to say this every week as well. If you don't want the Sharks to bottom out completely and the Sens get the first and second overall pick, what's wrong with you? 
because that has to happen. <laughs> oh yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. If it ended right now and standings were as they should be and there was no lottery, the Sands would currently have picks three and five. Should we uh, take ourselves down to the Tankathon for a moment as we're getting about that time <laughs> of the year? Good idea, good let's idea. Let's have a quick look. I'm just loading it up now, so I'm going to do uh, one sim lottery and let's see where <laughs> we end up. Do, 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 do. So current sim has got uh, Ottawa winning the first overall pick and uh, yes. San Jose bumping down to the sixth overall. But still, oh. that's the thing. Like They don't have to get one and two for the Senators to be in a bloody good situation in the draft, especially in this draft. No. And draft. Scary. I mean, Batman hates the fact that the Sens are a complete disaster. If he's got any sense, <laughs> oh, he'll yeah, he, it. Oh yeah, he should. He should. But I was, <coughs> I was thinking about this earlier, because they, they hired their CEO today, didn't they? Or yesterday? Or yes, yeah, yeah, I read an interview with him. And like, um, that, that registered not at all. And it just made me think, yeah, like, completely. yeah, we have not heard anything about the Sens for at least a year now. Like, they've just faded back into, oh, I haven't thought about the Ottawa Senators in months devastatingly, the Ottawa Senators have become a hockey franchise. Very, very normal now. Doing very normal things. In, in, yeah. Instead of instead of some kind of one-team news outlet, which they were for ages. <laughs> Basically TMZ <laughs> in a jersey. <laughs> okay, how many started scratches you got? Uh, I've got a pair of each. No, I got th- I've got three, and then one scratch that I just love to the ends of the earth. Oh, so, uh, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that. Start with your... Who's your first starter? Columbus Blue Jackets, current underdog champions, I would say, of the NHL. Who better to drop the puck at a game this week than James Buster Douglas, who shocked the world 30 oh, years ago this week when he yes. knocked out Mike Tyson in Tokyo. Oh, I was thinking, which where was, do I know that name? At the time, he was the longest ever odds for, for a boxer to win a boxing match. I remember my dad and my uncle and friends stayed up to watch the fight. And they were just, they just came back the next day like they'd just seen, I don't know, they like like they'd just seen Parasite or something. <laughs> they were just sort of, world's they changed. were just in complete, yeah, the world's changed. They were just stood in complete shock. And I said, what happened? And he just, you know, he said, oh, Douglas won. And it, the way he said it was like he'd been at war or something. He just couldn't believe what he'd seen in his, in, you know, it wasn't real. No one better to drop the puck for the Blue Jackets. Perfect. A match made in heaven. I'm going to start another noted scrapper. Uh, I'm going to start Antoine Roussel and a, and a, and a fan <laughs> alongside with this him. This is great. A little double. So Antoine Roussel. Who 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 were they playing? I forget the team. Oh, I can't remember. Doesn't matter. Whoever Jared Tenordi plays for now. Maybe the Sabres. I might be making that up. Whatever. So he steals Jared Tenordi's stick and he lobs it into the crowd. The fan who catches it <laughs> proceeds to chug a beer in celebration. What what more could you want out of a, out of a comedy double act in this uh, in this day and age? Moi, magnifique. That may have been the most hockey segment of the year so far. I think so, yeah, for, for starting. I think it's just very purely pure hockey related. Definitely. My next starter is Hockey Day in Canada, but a certain part of Hockey Day in Canada, because I'm sure it was a lovely affair. But the best bit was they had hockey dogs on show. And one caught my eye the most, as there was a German shepherd pup called Nigel. And I'm starting Nigel <laughs> because I love pets who've got human names. I think it's fantastic. I mentioned on Twitter at the time, uh, I had a friend who had a cat called Glenn, which was brilliant. And my friend Paul, who lives in Manchester, he's got a cat called Blade. And he told me when I went around to his house, he said, oh, Blade's like in a bit of a feud with Jeff. And I was thinking, why is your cat in a feud with a guy called Jeff? Nope, it was another cat called Jeff. Animals are human names. What's not to love? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. What would you, uh, what human name would you give your, your cat if you get one? Do you know what it is? I would actually give it a, a full name. Yeah. So something like Jonathan Smith or something like that. Not just one name. It'd have to be like a proper name, a full name. John, John Smith would be a good one. It'd end up being something terrible because like, my wife will be like, oh, well, our daughter's got to pick it. And I'm like, fucking fine, all right. What's he called? He's called Mittens. I'm like, oh, Christ. All right, fine. My um, my, my daughter's getting to the... It's, it's this part of the podcast, by the way. Uh, my daughter's getting to the yeah. age where... So we were at the, she started telling stories and making things up. So we were at the dinner table today, she told this incredible story about this big green. It's called monster. lying, Will. Which, yeah, yeah, she's getting really good at lying. But no, I mean literally like okay, that's better. making up stories yep. like a long time ago there was a big monster, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But the point is when it, she tries to make up names for things, like for her dollies or like the monster <laughs> in her story, but like she doesn't understand either naming conventions or like the basic conventions of the English language or whatever. 
So the names she she makes up are just really weird words. Uh, oh, she 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 said one today was like Sasa and like Rasha, and, uh, just weird. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know what they sound like, but it's just very. And the way she pronounces them as well, it's like she's saying nothing at all. She's just making making mouth sounds. I'm like, there you go. There's a name. And I was gonna say that does sound slightly terrifying. That maybe say say or Russia one day make her do things like oh, set Jim. fires, or <laughs> they told you know, me that kind of thing. They told me to push my baby sister out the window. <laughs> yeah. Even more. They told me to make sure mummy stays little. under the water in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> they said she can breathe. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit! Have I scared you now? Sorry. Yeah, a little bit. Who's your Who's your next star? My final starter is, and I'm not sure if I've ever disclosed this on here, but I fucking love dinosaurs. Oh. I think they're so cool. Oh, and the oh, fact a new one has been found, and it's been found in Canada. Canada? Hockey? Come on. It's a new species of Tyrannosaur nicknamed the Reaper of Death. Oh, oh brilliant. That's pretty naughty. Brilliant. That's pretty good. I, I just realised that I made you go back to back, so I've still got another starter to to hit you with. So my, my next one, another hockey-related one. And this one's rooted in, in justice. We all like a bit of justice. I'm going to start Boko Mama for uh, delivering some sweet, sweet, meaty vigilante justice to the cranium of Brandon Manning in revenge. Did you see this? Oh, 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 boy, oh did, did I, I see this? Did I see this? You might know Brandon Manning uh, from such previous films as him racially abusing Boko Mama on the ice. Boko Mama beat the fucking shit out of this racist prick, <laughs> and it was beautiful. <laughs> it was beautiful. <sighs> what a hero. Well, absolute hero. Deserves a call up for that. He deserves the uh, deserves the lady bing. <laughs> deserves sports personality of the year. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's not English, but I want to nominate. <coughs> oh, well, um, yeah. Jeez Louise. Okay. Uh, you, you got two scratches. I, I do indeed. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be swift. My first one's uh, I'm going to scratch the Golden Knights for, uh, for stealing the San Antonio Rampage and moving them imminently to, to the greater Las Vegas area. Isn't it now that the Stars don't have basically a minor league team to send players to? Or won't have next season or something? No, so they're not. The the, the Stars minor league team is the Stars. The Texas Stars. They're based oh, Texas in, Stars, of course. Yeah. They're based in Cedar Park. I think it's near Austin. I might be. Yeah, I think it's near Austin. No, the Rampage, I think they were the Blues affiliate. But the point being, it's at the start of the 2010s, there were three AHL teams in Texas. And uh, the Houston Arrows. And now the San Antonio Rampage have been bought and moved out of Texas for through no fault of their own fans. It's um, yeah, just a, like obviously I'm not that invested in Texas as a whole, but like the the idea of of having your club taken away even though you're selling out the arena every week and stuff like that, there's no financial issues. Just a bit of a sad sad side of the sport. So um, yeah, fuck you, Bill Foley. I'm gonna scratch Ben Bardsley. Now, the name doesn't ring any bells to anybody, because I know, I know it won't, but he's 38, and he's a gym owner from Stockport, which is near Manchester. Mr. Bardsley made a personal injury claim after falling into an empty pond that was being dug out in 2015. He said as he was looking at what was being done, he was struck by the bucket of a digger that was clearing Ooh. out somewhere else and knocked, and knocked into the empty pond. Jeez Louise. <clears throat> and he claimed in his medical evidence that he fell with his arms outstretched which caused injuries to his neck and his back and left him unable to lift weights, therefore causing him to have an anxiety of heights and lose work because obviously he's a gym owner. The insurance company Aviva, who acted for the pond supplier, was suspicious, so they instructed lawyers to investigate further. When they investigated further, they found an array of posts on social media showing Mr. Bardsley lifting incredibly large weights after his <laughs> supposed accident. Mr. Bardsley also posted a video of himself grinning from ear to ear as, as he entered a capsule on the vertigo slide in Benidorm, which descends at more than 60 miles an hour in just three seconds from a height of more than 100 foot. In the video... After he exits the capsule, he is seen laughing and flexing oh his muscles in front of a group of children. <laughs> he was ordered to pay fifteen thousand pounds in legal costs. <laughs> it's like he, it's like he, he took a list of his grievances and was right, right. I better get evidence of me doing all these things. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That's, 
<laughs> fucking idiot. That's fucking incredible. Absolutely incredible. Do you know this geezer? Oh dear. No, never met him. I always check the BBC News every day, and it was just it. Honestly, the it was just the picture. It was just a picture. It's it's the picture of this dude as he's about to go on this slide in Benidorm, and it's just him with just a massive. He's got his sunglasses on, a massive cheesy grin on his face, and it said, you know, it said something like, "Heights anxiety attack victim, you know, found on Benidorm slide." And I was like, "I've got to read this. I've got to read this. Just fabulous." <gasps> Europe's big- biggest slide. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the idea that he says after he gets off the slide he's laughing and flexing his muscles in front of kids <laughs> yeah look at me oh, I'm a don <laughs> mate, the absolute size of these dumbbells I know they're huge <laughs> they're so big what a dumb bell oh, there, you there, you there you go there you go ah oh, oh, what mate. a guy All right. incredible absolutely <coughs> how the hell is a geezer that tonk getting hurt by falling into a pond it's not even that how he did never, he think he was going to get away never, with it never had a chance Never like, stood a chance. <laughs> You're doing a personal injury claim that specifically says, I have a fear of heights and I can't lift weights. You then post on social media, you lifting weights and not having a fear of heights. Clearly. What, like, how did you think it was going to go? Oh, my God. And it's like, <laughs> with the lifting weights thing, he clearly loves lifting weights. Yeah. <laughs> now, why would you claim that you can't do something that you do every single day? <laughs> at least, at least... I love the idea as well. This was this was 2015, and the claims only just been sorted out. So I imagine if you lift weights every day for five years, you're going to get bigger. So at oh. some point, his solicitor must have been <clears throat> saying to him, "You look massive, mate. Are you sure you're not lifting any weights?" <laughs> He's like, "No, can't do it. Can't do it. I'm terrified of them. I can't do anything." Or even like, even the other way, if he's gone from lifting weights every day, which I assume he was before the accident. To then supposedly not being able to do that, he'd lose so much muscle mass. Exactly. Oh. And he just doesn't. He just he's still massive. <laughs> what an absolute legend. What an absolute oh, legend. Great. Speaking of people who are idiots making false claims, I'm going to scratch Anthony Stewart. Have you uh, heard about what this man has had to say on Hockey Central at noon this past week? I didn't. What did he say? So Anthony Stewart, he's, um, he's on, on Hockey Central with all-around gem... Jeff Merrick. They're talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Shock horror. Uh, and and Stewart claims that um, one of the big four, being Matthews, Marner, Tavares and Nylander, is expendable. Which is in, in itself not, not an outrageous thing to claim because yeah, you've got four incredible forwards. That's a lot more than any other teams, etc. Et the reason yep. that they're expendable, according to Mr. Stewart, the defendant, is uh, because Kasperi Kapanen is elite. Oh, God. And could take one of their jobs like that. Deary me. This is Wee Willy Winky, Kasperi Kapanen. <laughs> Wee Willy Winky. <laughs> <laughs> Upstairs and downstairs. I just... Do you know what it is? We just live in an age <coughs> where you've just got to have a take. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. Just say shit. It, it doesn't matter. You know, there's no comeback or anything. Oh, yeah. It? Just fucking say whatever you want. No one, it doesn't matter. No one cares. <laughs> Isn't that what we're trying to do? No, but I don't think we do though. That's the that's like that's my point. Is that like when we're wrong, we all just say, "Yeah, all right, that was that was fucking stupid." I don't know why I said that, but I guarantee you, you challenge Anthony Stewart on this, he'll just double down just and say, say yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like we we say dumb stuff, but not that dumb. Cheese Louise. Of course, I wouldn't say anything that dumb. <laughs> Christ, <laughs> things are just flat out incorrect. Yeah, oh. that's it. I'll be wrong. And I'll say something stupid, but I'm not. It's not completely incorrect. Like there, there'll be a reason why I might think something, but like there's no way that Anthony Stewart believes that. <laughs> he can't. He can't. No, that that's no. that's really, really, really dumb. Really dumb. It's like saying, yeah, the Bruins should have traded away Bergeron last year because they had Rick, uh, cause they had Riley Nash. Yeah. No. Well, Sean, Sean Corral is coming through, so it'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, you don't need Marshand anymore. No, no problems. All right, let's get on then. We are on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and sometimes your grandfather's dying breath. Also, it's been really cold here. and Well, cold for us, so a five-star review on iTunes would warm us up greatly. On to the second part of our interview with Gillian Kemmerer. We discuss her covering the Olympics, the Alpha Fellowship and what it means, living in Russia, and why she's hockey's answer to a famous film character. Here is part two with Gillian Cameron. 
So moving on then, as I said, there's a toilet roll list here of things you've accomplished. <laughs> when you went to the when you went to the Olympic, how did you decide where any good stories were or what athletes to interview? Or was that sort of preordained and you know you have like set times? No, it was a cool opportunity actually. I was working for our Asset TV in New York, which is a financial news and research platform, and I had put forward an idea to them about doing something on the business of sports. So they actually created a digital channel called Sportfolio. And we interviewed brand CEOs, athletes who became business people, agents, et cetera. And so it was really interesting. And and I had done a ton of reporting leading up to the Olympics on the business of the Olympic Games. And I didn't even know up until about a week before that they were going to send me. In fact, I was dating someone at the time who had not been reporting on the Olympics at all and randomly got sent. And I was so furious. I was like, I can't believe (laughs) he's getting sent. And I've been working on this for months. And then I just, I really put it into high gear the last couple of weeks. We just got everybody in the studio we could get. And Finally, my boss was like, all right, we have to send you. You have to go. So it wound up, it was a really wonderful surprise. I was packing the night of the opening ceremony. But once I got on the ground, it was framed. The whole thing was the business of the Olympic Games. So for me, I just kind of walked around and I looked at the most interesting activations because brands spend so much money to get that privilege of using the Olympic rings or to have any kind of real estate, marketing real estate at the Olympics. And so they, they activate in these really dramatic ways. So I wound up going into these, you know, they set up these houses, hotels, parties, and just going into them and being like, Hey, I want to interview the person who, who came up with all of this, who, who decided the strategy. And so I wound up interviewing people like the head of marketing for Nissan or the head of Olympic marketing for Dow chemical. And some of the stories were fascinating. I I did it more just out of a walking around and looking around, seeing who's there. And and Dow, for example, what's so cool about them, they're an Olympic sponsor and they, they do things like the field hockey, the actual material that the, the field hockey, it's not court, it's not grass either. I don't know how to explain it, but the material they're playing on, they do that. And they do the piping underneath the Olympic village that contains all of the the broadcast wires. And and they help to facilitate the signal between the village and the broadcasters. And they do it basically as a warehouse uh, to show off to potential clients what they're capable of. So they'll take a client and they'll be like, well, look at what we did for field hockey here. You know, they sit you in the front row and give you the VIP experience. Like we could be doing this for your business. And I found that so interesting that wow, it was basically yeah. like a giant showroom for them. Um, so I got to learn some really cool stories about how the, the sponsors make use of those activations, because let's face it, the price tag is astronomical and they have to be really creative. And, and I got to learn some really cool things. And I even got a little interview with Gabby Douglas to the American gymnast, who is such a an amazing force of nature hearing about how as a, as a young woman, she's managing her finances and her fame. It was very cool. And and her mom was sitting right there and obviously her mom is fundamental and all that. So I definitely got to hear some cool stories while I was in Rio. Winning the rights to the Olympics is always seen as this giant, it is a giant massive boon to the economy and all that kind of thing. And then you look back sort of like two or three years after the event and the pools are all run roughshod over. There's grass everywhere. Things are just growing over things. And it's just, you just think, oh God, it's so sad. Like this was a hive of activity and bringing the world together. Me and my wife were at a, and we'd gone out for our anniversary and we're at a, a place in Manchester, a, a hotel. And it was when Mo Farah, the, the British distance runner, he was going for the 5,000 and 10,000 meter double, like the first guy to do it. It was at the 10,000 meters. It was on the TV in the, in the lobby of the hotel. So we said, well, before we go up, let's, we'll just watch it because like Mo's racing. So on one side, there was an English wedding going on. On the other side, there was a, an Indian wedding going on. And at one point, an, an English family walked out, all white, and then an Indian family walked out. And they just kind of stood looking at each other. And I was like, oh God, like, is this some kind of, what's going to happen here? Is like, is something happening? I'm not like, I was kind of a bit nervous. And then they both just kind of looked at the TV and then everyone else, they they were kind of shouting to people and then everyone else came out. So now there's like 400 people in this lobby that holds (laughs) about 200 people. And then when Mo Farah crosses the line, everyone just mixed. There was drinks being thrown, hugging, high-fiving. And I was just, this is amazing. This is what sport can do. It can just bring people together. And then after a few years, it's just, it's all gone to ruin and like things aren't being used anymore. And it's just so sad. I know. I, I'm such a, a passionate lover of the Olympic movement. It's it's so incredible. And, and the stories like that 
of how they bring countries together and, and you kind of unite around the beauty of what human beings can achieve. It's so yeah. moving and so special. And, and it's such a shame that it, it's really not been able to be achieved in a financially responsible, feasible way. I mean, hosting yeah. the Olympic Games or the World Cup is an immense financial burden and responsibility. And, you know, I think that these organizations, when they award these games, have a responsibility to think about the state of the economies of the countries they're awarding to. And and fortunes rise and fall. When Brazil was, was given the Olympics and the World Cup, they were on a boom. And just maybe a year or two later, they were on a bust. And it became very difficult for them to foot that bill. And these organizations have a lot of cash. And they're very reluctant to dull it out, but there there just needs to be better operational standards in place because I, I fiercely believe in the Olympics and I I would be devastated to see them cease to to you know move around the world and give everyone the opportunity to share in the experience. But yeah, I agree. There there has to be some tightening up financially and, and some consideration there because some of these amazing arenas are they never are used again. And that's that's totally unacceptable. Think of the the waste that that goes into that, the the labor, the money. It's just unbelievable. Um, and we also have to worry too then about how these countries are actually building and the labor, the way that they're paying and, and treating them. It's it's difficult to monitor. And I think that these organizations have to take a bit more of a responsibility in how these games are are executed and managed. I don't know if you guys get coverage or not in North America about the World Cup in 2022 in Qatar, but the reports about cheap labor, people's rights being abused, and you know, like you've got to work 18 hour days in this 45 degree heat because it's got to be finished. It's the World Cup. We've got to finish it. It's really sad. And you know, like all the corruption and everything. It's hard to right. overcome. As I was reading your bio, I noticed the Alpha, the, was it the Alpha Fellowship? Mm -hmm. was the, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, i.e. me, what does that entail? What's the kind of goal of, of, the, of the Alpha Fellowship? So the Alpha Fellowship is given every year to somewhere around 14, 15 young leaders or specialists between the US, the UK, and Germany. And the intention is to give people exposure to living and working in Russia in an attempt to encourage and foster relations, understanding, and it's a program that's been in place for almost two decades. Um, and so it's it's this professional fellowship put on by Alpha Bank in Russia that sponsors a couple of people from, from each country to live and work and to study the language and to get to know some newsmakers. And, and for example, we met with the ambassadors of all the countries that were represented in the program. Uh, and just to give you a, a better understanding of what's happening in Russia, because let's face it, the comprehension of Russian culture and life and, and especially working life, I mean, it's next to zero for most people because there is still a bit of a barrier between Russia and the rest of the world. So yeah. um, I'm someone who's always had an interest in the region and actually stemmed from hockey as a kid and then grew into more of a professional interest. So it was a, an interesting opportunity. It's a competitive opportunity. It was obviously something you wouldn't hang your hat on unless you knew for sure you got it. But I took a shot for it, interviewed, applied, and, and was lucky enough to win it. And so I moved to Russia for a little, actually, I think about a year on the dot. And I studied Russian I wound up working uh, in the KHL. I was working for Kunlun Red Star, the expansion team of the K, as well as Sport Express, which is Russia's largest sports newspaper. Um, other classmates of mine were working in energy or consulting or human rights, and all of us just were united by that interest in the region. And it was a really fascinating program, an immense opportunity, and for someone who had always wanted to have exposure to Russia, knowing that it would be hard to get because obviously work visas are not are not freely distributed by any means. It was a really yeah. cool opportunity to get time there. So was there a link between anyone in your family and Russia, or was it just you'd already had an interest in the region? There's absolutely no link between anyone in my family and Russia, and everyone always asks that. It's so funny. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Italian-American, so it's, yeah, uh, okay. no. But when I was growing up, and this is so pathetic to admit, but it's true, the first Russians were playing in the NHL, and I was fascinated by them. So like the, the late 90s, especially, you had the Russian Five in Detroit, and yeah. they were so fascinating. They played such a different brand of hockey than anything I'd ever seen. They were just so slick. They were so creative. They had the sixth sense for one another at all times. And I, I became obsessed. I wanted to know everything about Russian and Soviet hockey. And, you know, especially once you get into the political overlay, the propaganda, the interesting 
collaterals and the kitsch and all of it. It just, it was so fascinating to me. And so I became just really interested in Russian hockey. And then because of that, I became really interested in Russia full stop. And I wound up studying Russian history a great deal, Russian politics. I wound up traveling a great deal to the region, whether as a tourist or, you know, even when I was working as a financial journalist, I had a regional interest. So it was just very, very, uh, it was, it was like a funny start to it all. It really did come from guys like Sergei Fedorov playing in the NHL, but eventually it, it shaped my career, funny enough. Sometimes people just have any sort of notion, just kind of latch on to a thing. I need to know more about you, your situation, what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that completely. And so when you were when you're traveling around Russia then, like how did you, as a woman, did you notice any differences between sort of Russia and America or anywhere else in Europe? Or was it is it all kind of the same? There are massive, massive differences culturally. Um, some of them are actually even hard to put a finer point on. But, you know, I think there are definitely gender roles between men and women, how women are expected to present and, and how they're perceived. But none of it, it, you know, I always try to approach it from an open mind as opposed to a judgmental one. And I'll give you one interesting example, which is that for the Women's Hockey League in Russia for um, this past year, actually every year, they pose for a calendar. And this year, like, they're they're like, I don't think they actually they might be naked. I don't know. But it's not like it's not super like pornographic. It's not what I'm trying Yikes. to say. But they <laughs> are covered in flowers and fruit. And it's very feminine, very traditionally feminine. And some of the North American players that play over in the league are like, yeah, we were just like, we're absolutely not going to pose for that. Forget it. <laughs> and then some of the Russian girls, like, you know, you get a mixed bag. Some of them are like, okay, I'll do it. I understand it's for the league. And then others who are like really embracing it and excited about it. And they're, they are beautiful and they want to celebrate it. You know, like, so there's just, there are some different, some different relationships between men and women that I noticed. Um, also some wonderful and beautiful things about how deep the friendships are in Russia. When it's your birthday, you you buy everyone else dinner and everyone gets up and makes a really emotional speech about you that's very meaningful. Um, they give flowers really liberally. The, the bouquets of flowers in Russia are stunning. They give giant bouquets for birthdays and any kind of celebration. There's like a real love and, and depth of feeling within friend groups. I mean, obviously families are close. So there were so many things I observed both, you know, to the positive side and also things that make you think, you know, inevitably. And, and also the relationship between the Russian people and their government is interesting. Talking to cab drivers, talking to Uzbek immigrants, talking to, to different parts of the population and hearing their opinions on what's going on. That was all super interesting. I mean, we look at it from very one specific lens in the West, in the West but, you know, in Russia, they're approached with different news outlets. They get different stories. They have different feelings with regard to nationalism and all of that was just such a learning experience. And yeah, of course, there were times when when it was uncomfortable, but for the most part, it was so fascinating to me to be able, especially once I started to speak a little better, to be able to communicate and, and hear those stories from the other side. That's interesting you mentioned being able to sort the language. My, me and my family always go on a holiday to Spain every year. So I've been learning only via an app, but I wanted to learn some Spanish so I could at least ask for things or, you know, so I'm not just doing the classic pointing and going, pass me that thing there because that's just terrible. And <laughs> we were in a cafe in Spain. There was an, an Italian family sat across from us and the, the dad was teaching his daughter English and she was like two. And oh I was thinking, gosh. Are you, in England, you never see anybody teaching their children other languages you don't you know i wouldn't be sat in a cafe in england listening to a dad teach his kid german it, it would never happen so we went we walked past the table and the guy moved his chair in and i used to know a girl who studied in italy she was at college and she taught me like three or four phrases so i just said thanks a lot in italian and he was like whoa because he knew i was english and he kind of looked at me like what well, you said thanks in italian he was blown away and i was thinking <laughs> yeah i mean that's all you need sometimes just a thank you or a, oh is this okay kind of thing and that's that's all you need sometimes to break down those barriers it means so much to people, especially yeah. in, in countries like Russia, where, you know, tourism is to some extent low. It's not super low. More and more people are going. But, you know, to be encountered by a foreigner who is making an effort with a very difficult language, I, the gratitude you can see is immense. And I certainly felt that I had a duty as someone who was living there to speak as much as I possibly could. And I don't know, it really, it does pay off. It's very enriching. But good Lord, Russian is hard. If you're picking a language right now, turn around, pick a romance language and never go back. <laughs> So <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. I was speaking to Will on last week's show, actually, about me trying to learn Cantonese to impress a, a girl at the time. Oh my and God. Yeah, it was the same. I, I do these kind of things. I'm a bit of an idiot, Julian. I do these kind of things when I went. <laughs> 
But it's I remember very just romantic. looking at it like, what have I got myself into? And I'm, I'm one of those people who, once I set my mind something, I think I've got to at least see this through as far as I can. Oh, and totally. I got to like the third page of the book. And I was like, nope, I am done. I'm sorry. I'll just have to stick to English. <laughs> it's so hard. Oh my God, can't sneeze. I can't even imagine. It's insane with Russian. It even looks terrifying if you try and read it. <laughs> There's triangles and I'm hanging on I me. Mean, that's a triangle. What's happening, kid? These are the letters I recognize. Like, why is that so... R backward? Like, stop it. <laughs> <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> Obviously, the, the Western narrative is that Russia is this oppressive grey land full of corruption, everything state controlled. I mean, how much of that is the truth? I mean, how much kind of freedom is there? How much of that did you see? So... If you're a, a tourist or you're living your day-to-day life in Moscow, and I'm, I'm going to limit my comments to Moscow and St. Petersburg for a minute. I did travel more widely in Russia, but if you think about the flagship cities and how Russia is largely portrayed gray, industrial, you know, just very bleak, they couldn't be more different. They're some of the most imperial, spectacular, vibrant, colorful, clean cities you could imagine filled with the richest history, the most beautiful gardens. I mean, you walk around Moscow, they've expanded the size of the sidewalks. Like you could reach your hands out on either side and feel like you have space and the, you know, gorgeous Gothic architecture and the old Kremlin, everything about it. There's so much romance to to Russia and to its aesthetic. And of course there are cities in Siberia and other places where they're very bleak manufacturing towns, mining towns. Okay. But the onion domes, the Orthodox churches, there's, there is so much beauty there. There's so much beauty. And especially once you talk about the natural part of Russia, Lake Baikal, the taiga, oh my God, just incredible, immense beauty, mind blowing. And I actually went to Lake Baikal in my last two weeks of, of time there. And we drove a hovercraft up the lake. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. In terms of your day-to-day life, you feel pretty able to carry out whatever it is that you want to do. And, you know, one thing that I always found striking was the impact of the sanctions on the supermarkets. You never really think about it until you go to buy groceries and asparagus costs like $10 and you can't find the cheese and the wine that you want because they've not been able to import it. That kind of stuff is always interesting. Um, But politically, yes, like you are limited in what you can say. I did see protests get broken up violently, especially around the time of pension reform, whereas in the U.S. you have the right to protest peacefully. Um, You know, you do know about stories of corruption, of state-run enterprise, of of entrepreneurs facing incredible, if not insurmountable, red tape. Yes, all of those elements do exist. As someone who's living there and working there in a non-politically sensitive industry, Um, You just have to deal maybe more so with the cultural differences. Um, But certainly you do notice that there are there are things there that are different uh, from how the rest of the world operates or how the Western world operates. But overall, I think the image of Russia, especially if you're a tourist, it's just completely and totally wrong. It's a place that is so worth going. It is so rich and diverse and beautiful. And, you know, there's really not enough I can say about it. It's it's like a secret sometimes that I feel that I have. Everyone looks at it as this horrible place and I go there and I'm just filled with such admiration and love walking around the streets of Moscow and looking at how beautiful it is and thinking, I can't believe people don't come here. I've spoken to my friends before about when we've visited certain countries or if, because we've got friends who live in Germany and, you know, we've like, we've obviously been to places in Europe and stuff. And I say there's, there's only a few countries where if you go to them and you get lost in your brain, you think, oh God, this is now a disaster. Like if you get lost in France, I mean, okay, no big deal. I mean, you can pretty much find your way anywhere. Somebody will speak English, but you have this idea of Russia in your head that if I get lost in Russia, there's a chance I'm working in a labor camp before the end of the day. Like, And it's like you say, it's just not true. People are just people and everyone just wants to get on and do their day-to-day thing, don't they? And it's immensely safe. I mean, I've, I've lived in New York. I've lived in Moscow. I've lived in London. When I lived in, in New York, I there were times when I did feel marginally unsafe at, late at night getting around certain places. But in Moscow... I never felt that, not even once. The crime rate is very low. There are reasons why it's very low. And of course, we can we can always dive into that. But, you know, it's very heavily policed. It's extremely clean. And the metro works like clockwork, which as a New Yorker is something I can't even fathom or comprehend. I literally, <laughs> this is this is a true story. The first time I rode the subway after moving back from Moscow, I cried my eyes out because I was like, this is revolting. Why did I come back? Like, this is the worst thing ever. In Moscow, you know, the subway, system was built in the kind of high era of Stalinist architecture. So it's flanked with 
chandeliers and mosaics and artwork, and it's super efficient, super safe, super clean. Um, so yeah, the, the image of, of Russia, particularly of Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, is just completely and totally wrong. And, and it's just one of the most incredible places. I think it's somewhere that everyone should try and see um, at some point in their lifetime. It's, it's really, really worth going. That's funny you mentioned the subway, because when we went to visit our friends who live in Germany, we got the, the train from uh, Munich Airport. And my friend said, he said, if the train says it's going to be 11.38, you get there before 11.38 because it will just leave. There's no waiting around. Like, you miss the train, tough. We've got family in London, so I, mean, I, I hate going to London. There's too, I, like, I'm not good with too many people. It's just it's just absolute chaos. Mm. Like, you're just packed in like sardines. And we were sat on the train in Munich. So obviously the train pulls up, we get on, and and you can see a woman. It's like a, it's like a movie. There's a woman sprint. It, was, it felt like it was in slow motion. It might have taken five seconds, but it felt like she'd been running for five minutes. <laughs> and she's sprinting towards the doors. And literally, she gets to two steps away, and the door just shuts in her face. And, and I was like, no, like "Oh my god!" Steps. Like the guy was just no. like, "No, it's this time to go. I'm going. Tough. You should have been here on time." German oh, efficiency that's, for you. Like, yeah, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. And um, you put on your Twitter bio that you are uh, forever a Muscovite. Muscovite is one of those words that I would hear all the time, but I never knew. I never knew what it meant. So uh, I did a little bit of research, and I uh, I read an article on the Guardian about it. And how different people take being a Muscovite to mean different things. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm going to throw this name out there, but um, Jennifer Emeriva. Okay. So she's a writer who lived in Moscow for, for 20 years. And she studied yeah. Russian history at Columbia. And she said that she's not a Muscovite. And people were saying, well, clearly you are. Like, you've lived there for 20 years. And she's like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not. I don't think I am. Whereas other people who say, once you work in Moscow or once you've lived in the culture, that's it. That's all because, you, you know, you're contributing to society. So uh, what does being a Muscovite mean to you? Wow, what a question. What a great question. <laughs> um, I, You know, for me personally, I... I was so enamored with Moscow when I lived there. And I, I know that some of it was just probably a lifetime of buildup of wanting to be there and wanting to spend time there. But I, I would walk around in just this state of wonder and awe. And I, I can't even begin to explain it. it would be the depths of winter, you know, right around this time of year when the sun never comes out and it's below freezing. And I would just bundle up and I would walk for 45 minutes an hour every morning and just admire. And I just remember thinking to myself, in the States, not to say that we don't have architecture, we don't have history, but to me, the the depth of history, the incredible diversity of architecture, the way that, that Moscow wears its history and its, its heart on its sleeve, I was so inspired by it. And I was, I think one of my greatest fears when I moved was losing that feeling of constant inspiration. And especially as someone who writes for a living, I, I I just had so much fodder because I was so inspired by everything I looked at that I, I just wanted to run home and try and capture it. I was taking pictures constantly. I think I have frostbite still to this day from having my phone out, <laughs> wanting to take pictures of everything. So for me, you know, to some extent it was, it was that feeling of just being in constant, in constant awe that I never wanted to let go of that I always associated with living in Moscow. And there's just a, there's something so cool about that city, about the people that live there. So effortlessly um, self-possessed and stylish and aware of them, of their history and themselves. And I, I always admired that. Um, I always admired that about Europeans more generally, but, but with, with Russians that live in Moscow, they're just always so put together. There's something so cosmopolitan about it. So I think maybe a little bit is, is aspiration on my part um, to be <laughs> as cool as some of the Russian women I met. But uh, I think overall, it was just that, that feeling of being in constant inspiration. And, and I still feel that way every time I go back. You were the first foreign journalist to ever have a, story, a cover story published for Sports Express, which is Russia's biggest sports newspaper. What was the story about? It was a one-on-one -on -one interview with Alexei Kovalev, who won the Stanley Cup with the 94 New York Rangers, had a very yes. long NHL career. Um, he went to Montreal. They called him L'Artiste because he was so immensely creative and skilled. He, Some say that he was one of the most skilled players that ever played, um, and he was such an elite competitor. Won the Olympics as well, won gold in 92. And at the time, he was coaching, and he still is actually coaching in China for the expansion team. 
uh, Kunlun Red Star in the KHL. He was making his coaching debut. So we sat down literally in a basement in Shanghai of some like ice skating center that they were using as their as their makeshift home. And we talked about his career, his transition to coaching. He like had a couple of notorious, well, one notorious feud with his old national team coach, Vladimir Krikanov. And he had a video game addiction that impacted him on the ice for a little bit. And he's just a very interesting, open, brash person. So we sat down and we had a great chat and it wound up on the cover, which was an immense surprise and, and honor. But he was very, very uh, generous with his time and with his opinions. So it was just a, a fun interview in general. I suppose I should ask you a couple of hockey questions here as, you know, that's kind of what this show is about, but you know, what can you do? If we have to. Uh, I don't know, you know, do a, do KHL fans or people involved with the league see that sometimes players are viewing it as like a second choice if they can't make it in NHL? And if they do, do they care about that? There's a sensitivity, I think, more on the side of losing prospects, using lo- losing young players who are major producers that then go over to the NHL. Um, Getting those guys that are at the end of their NHL careers are very often, I find, guys who probably still could be playing in the NHL, but a stroke of bad luck or a poorly timed injury meant that they had trouble breaking back into a lineup. Those guys are welcomed with open arms because they're so immensely talented and a lot of Russians come back. And some of those Russians are not at the peak of their playing careers or they are, but they're they're certainly not past it. And they decide yeah. to go home. And you can understand the reasons that would motivate that, especially as the KHL increasingly can pay more and more competitive salaries. They're not NHL level for the top tier of player, but they're they're good. And so I think really the sensitivity tends to be around guys that are 23, 24, are big stars in their hometown, and they get drafted and they go. Um, I, I've interviewed guys like Kirill Kaprizov and Ilya Sorokin who are – heavy, heavy hopes for the future of the NHL. I think Kaprizov's almost a done deal, but he'll be coming over next season. Sorokin looks like he'll come over soon. Um, And I remember they both played for Red Army. They play for Red Army right now. And the press team was a little cagey about me asking questions about North America. And I can understand that 100% from their point of view. But I think there's, you know, a, a general acknowledgement of where the KHL falls, but where I think a lot of people outside of Russia get it wrong is that the KHL is by far the second best league in the world. I think there's almost no question of its yeah. competitiveness. Um, and sometimes I've heard it argued that people think the AHL or others are better. And, and I simply don't think that's the case, especially when you look at the guys that are currently playing in the K. So, you know, on one hand, I'm sure that there is some sensitivity there, especially about losing talent. But on the other hand, um, I think there's some misperceptions about how good the K is because it, it is really, really good. Do you have any insight into the Vladimir Putin game that takes place every year where he scores like 27 goals? Like what what the Russians think of it? Do they think it's silly or do they know that they kind of have to get behind it or how do they view that? Um, you know, I think there's like a little bit of lightheartedness applied to it. So he played not that long ago. And interestingly, so two people that played alongside him, one is Igor Bootman, the famous jazz musician. He's a saxophonist. Um, I just saw him play in New York last week. He was spectacular. Um, He's just an unbelievable, he's probably one of the best musicians to have come out of Russia. And he has this great jazz orchestra that travels with him. And he was so good at hockey when he was younger that he could have almost played for CSKA, but he chose music instead. And he's you know, buddies with Putin and and plays alongside him. And that's always fun to watch because, you know, you would never expect that a jazz saxophonist would be such a prolific hockey player, but he is. <laughs> and he's an icon in Russia. And then Sergei Fedorov of the Detroit Red Wings, of course, yeah. um, is back in Russia. He's on the board of CSKA of Red Army, the team he defected from 30 years ago. And he was on the ice playing as well. Um, and so you tend to get some of these old Soviet heroes back, but Fedorov, I I thought it was kind of cool to see him out and about playing. I when I looked at some pictures and and some snaps from that night, but you know I think it's like you know this is his shtick. He loves hockey, but interestingly, the new U.S. ambassador, John Sullivan, is a massive hockey fan, and he dropped really? the, yeah he dropped the puck at a KHL game just a couple of nights ago, and he believes that that hockey could be a form of diplomacy to bring our countries closer together, which is something I'm massively passionate about. So I couldn't believe it when I heard him say it and when I saw him march out in his uh, in his Washington Capitals jersey, and I just thought, please, your mouth to God's ears, let that be true. 
I mean, there's a fair chance that we could see maybe Putin entered into this year's draft for the NHL. Then, if that's the, uh, I mean, because his goals record is ridiculous. So, I, I mean, why wouldn't you take him? He is a prolific sniper. Any team that's that's missing a forward <laughs> should look no further, in my opinion. Yeah, any teams need a first line sniper. You know where to look. <laughs> but you must draft him first in the first round. So, don't oh, so even yeah, think about first otherwise. overall. Well, we spoke to NHL history girl Jen, who runs a, a fantastic Twitter account. I love her Twitter. Yes fantastic so we had her on the show and she said to us that she's had correspondence before with people within the nhl who don't really appreciate what she does because she doesn't tell the party line so she will not say the original six because that's not true it wasn't the original six she said they're the surviving six mm. so she said there, were, there were other teams so she's like a historian she doesn't kind of follow the party line. She's a bit of a rogue. So I said, well, you're the NHL's answer to Indiana Jones then. Would you say then, Julian, it's fair to say that you're hockey's answer to James Bond? Because I feel like you've got a multitude of skills. You can work in any situation. You're multilingual. You're well-traveled. Can you say that to me again, please? And maybe another five (laughs) times. I I, I literally, I don't even know what to say. I'm so flattered. I'm a huge Bond fan too. Um, Oh, really? Oh, okay. Massive. Quick Bond question. Quick Bond question then. Here's, I've got a I've got a theory for the new Bond film, the 25th film that's coming out. I think I think he's going to die at the end. Oh my god! Do film. you think? Yes, uh... and I think what's going to happen is you're going to find out that he's not called James Bond. The name of the spy is James Bond. So he has his identity erased. He becomes James Bond. That's why there's loads of James Bonds. This is a bold. That's not take we we're gonna so have I to think... do this again when the film comes out but continue, <laughs> we'll have to, yeah we'll have to do a, re- a film review of the new bond film please so i think i think at the end of this one the daniel craig version is going to die whoever plays whoever's going to play the new james bond i'll just throw a name out there idris elba because why not he's oh, awesome that'd be movie. great it would be so cool i think then the new person playing james bond comes in meets m and he says okay then i don't know whatever jonathan smith you are now erased you are now James Bond. Mm. And then he becomes the new James Bond. And that kind of explains it. Kind of like a Doctor Who thing. Yeah. I, you know what? It would make sense given the fact that they change the character every couple yes. of years. So yeah, it would certainly make more sense than just, uh, you know, I was Sean Connery yesterday and I'm Roger Moore tomorrow. Exactly. And and Daniel Craig always said, I've not enjoyed, it's like there's times where I've hated playing this character. And I think he would find it interesting. Okay, we'll bring you back for one more because he didn't want to do it, but they kind of, kind of twist his arm a little bit with loads of money. But they could say to him as like a, a like a sweetener, okay, Daniel, here's the script, but just to kind of pacify you in some way, at the end, you're going to die. Because that would be then an amazing way to the tw- for the 25th film. Like that would be a mind-blowing thing that's never happened before. Can you imagine being in a place in your life where you could say, I don't want to be James Bond anymore? <laughs> Can you I can answer that, I can answer that easily. No, no, I can't. I can't either. Like if someone wanted to make me a Bond girl, I'd be like, sure, and I'll come back for the twenty fifth, the thirty fifth, the forty fifth, and the fifty fifth. No problem. I'm I'm available. Like, oh my yeah. god, the cars, the locations, the suits, the drinks. I, I don't know. What's not to like, Daniel? I don't really know what your deal is. It sounds it sounds fantastic. Every I think every boy at some point in his life thinks I could be a secret agent. How could I not be? It's easy. <laughs> like oh, every really? man has that. Because not men are like we're kind of all a bit dumb and stupid, but we all have that <laughs> idea of you're in you're in the shower and you're like, do you know what? If two guys broke into this house now, I could take them out. Like, yeah. No, you couldn't. But you think that because that's what you've got to do with your with your stupid male brain. Why couldn't so, yeah, my yeah, pen yeah. explode? Like maybe it does explode. <laughs> I just haven't used it correctly all this time. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever listened to Eddie Izzard or not or watched his comedy, but he has a joke about James Bond meeting Q. What are the things that didn't work? There must have been inventions <laughs> that Q gave him that were rubbish. He's like, Q, why do you give me jam trousers? What, what are jam trousers for? They don't make any sense. And he's like, we're just testing things, James. Don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> well, if he wants to give me a Lamborghini that's a little on the fritz, I'm sure it'll we can make do. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, and then uh, the final thing. Uh, are you still a keen tennis player, Julian? <laughs> Uh, Keen might misrepresent the the level of ability and skill that I currently possess. Um, but <laughs> yes, I do love tennis. And I, I had a great tennis coach named Ksenia when I was in Moscow. And we would play on the clay courts until winter, which came very quickly, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do. I love tennis. Okay. I'm sorry to do this to you. And I don't want to try and alienate you from any people or any of your friends or family. But I've got no. to ask you this from the tennis question. Who's the GOAT? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to go with Serena Williams. I think she's the GOAT. 
in men's it's, it's hard. I've always I've always been partial to Djokovic, but it's really hard for me <gasps> to discount Federer. Me too. Yeah. I, I see Djokovic. Yeah. I just think in the end of the day, he's going to be the guy who does it and overtakes everybody. Yeah. I th- I think it's very possible. I think Serena first and foremost for me. Novak second, um, and we have to give an honorable mention to Roger Federer's hair that absolutely never quits. No matter how sweaty he is, how many sets they've gone, that hair is the exact <laughs> same, and I don't, I can't fathom it. I have a, I have a long running. Um, I, I, it's kind of a jokey thing, but I would like men are just repulsive and gross. I hate them. I don't know why women even look <laughs> us. Like we're just disgusting. But Roger Federer is one of those guys. I'm just like, oh yeah, they got that one right. Like look at him. He's just like, <laughs> God damn it, Roger. Right. I always tell like, if Roger Federer had turned up, like, oh, Daniel, uh, sorry to be a pain, but I saw your wife walking down the street. Can I take her away for the weekend? I'd be like, oh, Rod, you sod off you go then. <laughs> but just bring her back, okay? <laughs> like, just how can I turn down Roger Federer? Yeah, just make sure she has a good time. Bring her back uh, safely on Monday. That's fine. That's great. Serena, though, I mean, oh, my God. She's, she's a ruthless competitor. I mean, her physicality, of course, there's absolutely zero argument she's the the total performer the elite athlete but mentally i don't know if there's anyone who's stronger than her she is just an absolutely dialed in dialed up competitor and i have so much admiration for the length of her career you know and her ability to play at that level for so long and and just for her intense determination drive she's she's everything that you could ever hope for and in a goat let's put it that way when they started out, everyone was talking about it was more about Venus, wasn't it? And Serena was kind of not pushed to the back, but oh, it's the two sisters, and like Venus is kind of she's the star, and and Serena's just actually no, hang on a minute, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hold my give beer. me a couple of years, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly, completely. She's yeah, and in fact, I saw a great documentary called In Search of Greatness about athletes that develop, and and really it focuses on some other athletes, Gretzky's in it, etc. But they have a little feature on her and her father talks about that relationship between Serena and Venus and growing up in Venus's shadow could very well have been one of the reasons why she developed to the heights that she did. It was like constantly being faced with that. It's do you shrink or do you rise up and and meet it? And and that's ultimately what she did. She did the latter. Last thing, anything you'd like to plug? Like to plug? Um, You mean social media wise, who I think people should be rooting for? Sell yourself. If you've got a chair you're trying to get rid of on eBay, you want to plug that, that's fine. <laughs> anything. No. <laughs> anything you want to you want to sell or promote? Anything at all? Um, I mean, I would just say follow me on Twitter. I, I tend to post a lot of goofy things about about Russian history of hockey. Um, I'm at Jillian Kemmer. Oh, I just started an Instagram and a TikTok, and they're both at Caviar Diplomat. And right now it's limited to a lot of history and travel photos, but eventually someone's going to teach me how to do those little dances that all the kids do on TikTok. And I, I promise, <laughs> I promise I will get involved. Um, but other than that, just uh, if you're not watching the KHL or the WHL, it's, it's worth a little visit. You don't have to replace your NHL allegiances, but there are some cool things happening in Russia, and I'd love to, to help you discover them. There we go. Jillian, thank you so much for taking time out to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. This was so much fun. Talk soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you again to Hockey's answer to James Bond. Jillian was very gracious to give us so much time. And before we get to the news, as always, we are sponsored by Wave Intel. Why not spend a romantic Valentine's Day with your significant other? Bottle of wine, nice meal, maybe a romantic movie. Then when it's getting hot and steamy, bust out Wave Intel's versus model and play versus model to really tip things over the edge. Wave Intel, online and on Twitter, being smart and sexy, so you don't have to. Okay. That's, uh, that's what I've got, Grace, for Valentine. I was going to say Halloween for some reason. For, uh, for... <laughs> that's, such a, that's such an amazing Freudian slip. <laughs> Just the same difference to me. Are they both same difference. invented yeah. by the Americans to make us make money? Yes. But no, I've just printed out a couple of game sheets from Wave Intel. I'm just going to laminate them, give them to her. I think it's a Thomas yeah, Tatar. It, maybe put it in a maybe put it in a card. A little surprise. Uh, d- d- no card. Why would you do a card when you've got a perfect present like that? You don't need a uh, need a card to back it up. Dan, I get the feeling that you don't do Valentine's Day. Is that true? We do cards. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a reasonable one. I like it. And even that's a stretch. Yeah, we we tend to do cards and like like a small present, like a like a. Secret Santa level, under a fiver, sort of. Sarah's already got the best present anyway. Go on. Me? Yes, that's debatable. Plus you gave her that last year, so... <laughs> you can't just keep, it's incredibly can't just keep debatable. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the, best, the best present is a man who thinks Predator is a perfect film. <laughs> oh, you 
have no taste. Yeah, oh. that's a word. That's a word. I'd, I'd sooner side with Anthony Stewart than you over bad takes. This, this <laughs> all right. Have we got some serious news here for fuck's sake? Yeah, jeez Louise. Okay, we will start out with Jay Bowmeister. Collapsed on the bench Tuesday night against the Ducks. Confirmed today it was a heart attack and credit to all the medical staff involved and the, the defibrillators were used, which is some scary shit when you hear that. I, I spoke to my dad, who, I don't know if I mentioned this on the show or not, but had a heart attack about six months ago. It, he said it's, it's very cliched, but his vision started to blacken around the edges and he said it felt like an elastic band was around his chest and someone was just pulling it tighter and tighter and tighter. And then he said he started to kind of lose feeling in like his hands and legs and stuff as he was blacking out. Oh, fuck, that just sounds terrifying. Just and horrendous. I remember, I remember Rich Peverly, uh, I think 2014, I yeah. think it was, when he was sat on the bench for the Stars and he'd had an operation on a regular heartbeat and it hadn't kind of fixed it and the same thing happened to him. So just credit to everyone involved, all the medical staff especially, who, were, who pulled out the stops. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of players get... Get a stick from you, know, us included. We like to we like to rag on players for for a nice performance and, and and make jokes at anyone and everyone's expense. But yeah, in, in times like this, like you know, thoughts go out to to Bo Meester and his family. It's, it's it's scary stuff, and and let's hope he he gets better soon. I'm going to mention it now, but I mean, he I don't think he can come back from this, can he? Oh, He's got to be done, right? It's hard to say, isn't it? Like I'm I'm no I'm no doctor. I'm no sort of expert on it because it happened to, to Yuri Fisher as well didn't it that was back in like 2012 oh, yes. I want to say yeah, but I, right. I don't know the details of the Fisher one but the, the you know, it's the early days with Bone Meester and, and you hate to speculate about stuff like that but the Peverly thing was due to like a, a pre-existing condition so I think yeah. Peverly not coming back to the game was partly down to the fact that he was already predisposed to, to cardiac issues as it was obviously you know having a heart attack's not Good for you, cardiac health, but I, d- I don't know whether it can it can he can be cleared as like a oh yeah you just had one because of X Y and Z you're not any more predisposed to him than than you were before sort of thing. But yeah, I'd imagine given his age and he's only on a one year deal, isn't he? Yeah. So yeah, I'd I'd imagine that'd be that. And I hope if he's healthy enough and he wants to play again, then he gets to play again. But if if not, I hope he I hope he makes some. No matter what it is, I mean, it makes the right decision for him and his family and his, and his health because, like, it's only bloody hockey at the end of the day, isn't it? What's interesting when I spoke to my dad is after his recovery, he was mentioned in all the things he's just not allowed to do. So yeah. him and his wife were told, like, they bought a hot tub about a year before and he's not even allowed to go in a hot tub because <laughs> it'll just increase his heart rate too much and his heart now isn't strong enough to manage, like, that increase in temperature Jeez, around his body. Geez. Which just blew me away. I was thinking, like, no way. And the same, he can't swim in the sea now on holiday because the sea's too cold. That's cr- and for the same reason, That's obviously, crazy. your heart gets a shock when it goes either soup. You know, if the, you know, if the temperature's too hot yeah, or too yeah, cold, yeah. kind of thing. You know, you get that kind of, oh, don't you? And he said, like, yeah, I can't, I can't do anything like that anymore either. That's I'm crazy. Like, no way. Is he allowed to fly? Isn't that mad. Uh, yes. Interestingly, my mum wasn't allowed to fly after her first, her first brain hemorrhage, which was like when I was like eleven. And she was told that I felt like you can't fly now for about sort of eight, nine, ten years. Was that because of, of the risk of um, of clotting? Or? Clotting in a, in a brain hemorrhage is good because obviously it stops the bleed. Oh, yeah, sure. But yeah. They, they basically, the vein in my mum's brain that burst, they had to attach it with a metal clip. And they said that when they, when they reattached the vein and basically put it back together, if she flew, there's a chance that the pressure could pop the clip. Oh my god! Which is like just you never think of these things, do you? No. You think like, oh, you know, you've like recovered from a heart attack or a brain hemorrhage, and oh, that's it. I'm I'm recovered. I'm you know I'm okay. But no, like my dad's got a laundry list of things he's just not allowed to do anymore, which is mad. Christ alive! Well, yeah. With that in mind, stay the hell away from it, J Bo Meester. Go and get a job scouting or something. Get a nice comfy comfy office job or something. It'll do you good now. Let's move on. Paul Maurice has signed a new contract in Winnipeg. The details are actually being kept secret, which I think are a bit weird. You never, um, get, you never get coach details, really, do you? You tend to get like I know, years, I, I've, but... and I've always found it strange. I suppose. I don't know why. Where it, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter, does it? It, it, it doesn't affect on the um, impact on the salary cap. So I suppose, you... but I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's the thing. It's purely like nosy. It's not, it's not valuable information, is it? It's just gossip. 
No, it's valuable so that fans can go, I can't believe he's making $5 million a year for this shit. <laughs> Yeah, but what, yeah, again, where does, something to rail against. Where does the um, where does it where does it end? Do do you want to find out how much the equipment manager earns? Do you want to find out how much the uh, the the hot dog vendor earns? In an ideal world, yes. <laughs> I want to know precise financial details of every member of my hockey club. Because there's the thing, right? See, you got to think of it the other way. If the hot dogs in Winnipeg are unbelievable, they're amazing, and the hot dog vendor guy makes fifteen grand a year. I mean, you go that- to say. Vancouver, and the hot dogs there are terrible, and that guy makes thirty grand a year. You could then go to bat for the guy in Winnipeg and say, "Come on, he deserves a raise. These hot dogs are amazing." Oh, how about how about like an organisational wide salary cap? Ooh, I love it. And like it extends to like equipment and stuff like that. The Zamboni driver. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> not how much you spend on a Zamboni is like governed by. Well, not but it's part of the larger budget that has to be in line with uh, with the rest of the league. Imagine, imagine the money management you'd have to do. Because think about something as stupid as that, right? If you're a Zamboni driver, you've got no money left, and he makes no money. The ice will be terrible every game. So yeah. every home game, you're playing on terrible ice, and you've got less chance of winning. But you could like save some money under the cap on like maybe a six D man or something. So you've got a bit more left for the Zamboni guy, and then you've got great ice, and you've got a better chance of winning. Yeah. We can't afford to pay the uh, the Zamboni guy that this week because we've had to call up someone from the AHL. <laughs> so we can't resurface the ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go, another layer. Because what this league needs more of is uh, is complications. Oh, we love complications in hockey. We love stats and numbers and all that kind of stuff, don't we? We've said it a million times. The best part of the NHL games is when you have to get the end of the season, you have to do the salary cap and all that stuff Gosh. and manage the team. It's Gosh. not playing the games. That bit's just boring. Menus. All I want is menus in my entire life. Yeah, just menus. Give me menus and trying to sort out finances for a non-existent hockey team that I've just made up. <laughs> <laughs> my question was around, uh, around Paul Maurice. Should he be in the Jack Adams conversation this year? I mean, no. <laughs> Not really. really? I, I get the argument because they've lost a bunch of, well, two D-men and they haven't been adequately adequately replaced by Kevin Shovel Day off and, and they've done better than expected, but they're still not exactly doing great, are they? They're still on the outside looking in, I think. They're clearly, clearly their best, the player who is their best D-man said at the start of the season, yeah, I'm not bothered, mate. I'll see you later. <laughs> and then bothered. the rest of the decor's made up with pieces of string and silly putty. <coughs> and they're still sniffing they're still sniffing around the playoffs. I mean that's that is impressive. Yeah, well, yeah, I I appreciate that, but all of that's on the back of um Con Hellebuck playing at Kerry Price two thousand sixteen levels. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, so, yeah, I thought so. I thought you'd say that. And they yeah, they're still outside. And my the second playoffs, so it's not. And my second my second question was do you think they've signed them now because there were other teams sniffing around? Yeah, I think so. I think so. It's it's a bit of a weird one, just in, in so much as like he's been there for a long time and they haven't really had as much success as you could have expected them to by now. So, you know, history would sort of indicate that they're going to move on and try and get a different voice in just to try and, try and rejuvenate the squad or whatever. But he's a good coach. You'd want him coaching your team generally. Yeah, I, I can't quite wrap my head around whether I think it's a good deal or, or not. I'm sort of leaning towards not, just because I do think to an extent you need to you need to cut bait if it hasn't worked for, for this long. But it's not like they've locked up Randy Carlisle for the next 10 years or something like that. Or John Hines, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. They're, Shit, they're not even in the worst position in their own division as far as, uh, <laughs> as, far as coaches. So um, That was a cheap shot. Sorry, National. Well, uh, well, no. No apologies to John Hines and, and the Predators. Jesus Christ. No apologies to the Predators, but, you know, I apologise to the fans for that one. It's a poor idea. The man has a wife at home, Dad. Come on. <laughs> He's got a wife and kids, God damn it! And she has to look at him every day and think, what a failure I have married. We have our first big trade of trade deadline fortnight, I guess you'd call it, maybe? Month, year. And it's... Calendar year. Yeah, year. And shout out to old man Rutherford. Who collects trades? I like I collect bad jokes. As he trades Alex Galchenyuk, my defensive prospect Kellen Addison, and a conditional first rounder to the Minnesota Wild for Jason Zucker. Saad into the Minnesota zone. 
Oh, checked away by Suter. What a play by the Minnesota defenseman, and now it's two on one. Parisi for Zucker. Zucker in for the win. He scores! Will, you always have some hot takes regarding trades. What do you think of this one? Yeah, fine. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think I think it's fine. Like, um, Zucker's a decent player by all accounts, as far as I understand. Like, I'm not super familiar with his work, but he, he scores the goals, and they want him to score goals. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see how he fits in in Pittsburgh, because it's that age-old thing of you can only play with Crosby if you're, you know, technically shit. And it's, it's one of those ones where I... I don't think the I don't think anyone got fleeced really. The Penguins gave up a decent enough package, which was good for Minnesota to get, but it also wasn't really that bad for them to give up. You have got to give to to get, so obviously you don't really want to give up a prospect like Addison, who's meant to be really good, a D prospect that you're not going to need immediately when they're trying to win cups. Still, a first round pick that's going to be at the worst, at the highest, like twentieth overall. It makes sense, is what it is. It makes sense for everyone, and good on them. I think the the the, the one funny, the one funny thing I, I think about it is Bill Guerin still saying like, "Oh no, I expect players to keep trying, and we're going to make the playoffs and all that." Oh god, yeah, it's fucking like, hell, mate. Come on, read the fucking tea leaves. It's it's over. It's been over for this franchise for roughly seven years. No, don't make the same mistakes that Chuck Fletcher and Paul Fenton made before you. So, a bit of talking out of, out of both sides of his mouth, but we'll see what happens there. As far as the trade itself, fine. Perfect. Perfect B all around, I think. The thing with Kellen Addison was that John Marino has kind of burst out of the gates, hasn't he, this season for the Penguins? Oh, yeah. So, and... it kind of meant that, well, okay, Addison, we can kind of afford to lose in them. It's, it's, not, too, it's not too bad. And I spoke to a friend of the show, Josh, on Twitter, who was actually a Minnesota Wild fan, to get his take. And he said that the Penguins have been mugged off and he's delighted. <laughs> oh, I, well, so. I think that's a bit that's a bit strong, but adding Addison's going to be a good player, I think. So, but it, it's it's a thing where in in some ways, then Minnesota could have got a good package and still not strictly mugged off Pittsburgh because they don't really need the package that they've given up, you know, or at least it's not in fitting with with their immediate plans. It's like if you've if you've got two Ferraris. And you you swap one of your Ferraris for I don't know bag of crisps. Like yeah, you're sort of getting bugged off. And you don't need that other Ferrari, do you? <laughs> bag of... Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that's what it is. A Ferrari for a bag of crisps is a mugging up. I don't care if you've got fifty Ferraris. Yeah, but if, you don't, if you don't need all right, a, all right, a Ferrari for a baby seat because you haven't got a baby seat for your first Ferrari. There you go. I suppose because that's what this that's is. That's better. They've got good stuff. The stuff they need. So, so what I'm trying to say, Dan, is uh, the Taylor Hall for Adam Larson trade was perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> Made perfect set. I'd do it again. Man, it's interesting that Alex Galchenyuk gets moved again. Oh, mate, like, he's just like, it's fucking nothing, isn't he? Something I found out today about Alex Galchenyuk, now that you bring him up, unsurprisingly. Go on. Oh, let, me, let, me, let me get stats for you. Let me get stats for you. So, Skalchenyuk was oh. drafted in 2012. 2012. He went third overall. I'm sure you remember that. Yeah. Behind um, I do indeed. such revolutionaries as Neil Yakupov and Ryan Murray. In his draft year. What a draft that was. What a draft. In, in his draft year, Alex Skalchenyuk, yeah. Yep. 2011-2012, played for the Starnia Sting of the OHL. How many games do you think Alex Galchenyuk played the year before he was drafted? How many regular season games? The year before he was drafted? Yeah. So, in so the season... this answer is either clearly this answer is either stupidly low, like 8, or stupidly high, for some reason, like 93. So I'm going to say 21. Alex Galchenyuk played 2 Regular season games Fuck in the off. year preceding being drafted third overall. And how many points did he have, Dan? One. It was none. He scored no points in the regular season preceding his draft and then got drafted third overall. <laughs> All right, hang on now. What? I'm looking at this. Hang on. <laughs> like, what the fuck? It is slightly improved in the playoffs where, uh, where he played six games and had four points. What? I just... <laughs> <laughs> what? That's, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't make. I get why there was hype around him because in his 
in his age 16 season, his first year in the OHL, he had 83 points in 68 games, which is fantastic for a rookie. But I just don't get how can you be injured for an entire season and still get drafted third overall. This is what Dude, happens. in the year the year before that, 2009-10, under 60, Chicago Young Americans under 16, 38 games, 87 points. Yeah, absolutely tore it up. So like he, he was obviously going to be a good prospect. And like the year the year after he had 61 points in 33 games in the OHL. So yeah, he was he was a good prospect. But I just can't get my head around not seeing a player for an entire year of his junior career and then drafting him third overall. It's mental. All right, hang on. <clears throat> All good. We're down a wormhole. I like this. I like yeah. this. The, the point being, no, no wonder this happened. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is. This... I mean, yeah. In hind, in hindsight, I mean, <coughs> here we are. It's uh, this makes complete sense. That's that's why, because because nobody truly analysed Alex Galchenyuk <laughs> until he got to the NHL. Go on, what you got for me? Right. Let's do some notables from the first round of the 2012 draft after Alex Galchenyuk. Okay, do you want me to guess? Because I've got it open. I'll close it. No, I'll just read out some names. Morgan Riley went fifth. Matt Dumba went seventh. Philip Forsberg went 11. Hampus Lindholm at sixth. Oh, yeah, Hampus Lindholm. God, I didn't even see him. Radek Fax at 13. Cody Cece at 15. Oh, there's another redo. Ooh, ooh, rough. Tom, Thomas Hurtle. Tom Wilson, 16. Tomash Hurtle, 17. Terry Vinen at 18. Vasilevsky went at 19. Yeah, not, oh, not, not the worst draft, really. Brady, Only Matt at 22. Brady Shea. Brady Shea, yeah, at 28, yeah. Not not terrible, but... like, Did yeah. the Canadians not think he dropped to the second round or something? There must have been so much buzz about him. Like, I could have I could have understood if he'd gone, like, late teams or something. <laughs> But how do you risk how he like it's it's hard to go back and, and understand the sort of hype around it sort of thing. It's like not not exactly the same, but if if Lafreniere didn't pay, play in the games this year, he'd probably still go higher, I'd imagine. But I still just can't get my head around that. Missing an entire season. That Galchenyuk pick That Galchenyuk pick would be the kind of pick you make if you have two picks in the first round. Yeah. And you kind of think, Okay, we've we've used our good pick that we wanted already. So, for example, Buffalo picked at 12 and 14. So you might have thought, okay, well, well, we've got our 12 pick. We've got our guaranteed first rounder that we like. Galchenyuk could maybe be something. Let's take him with our next, you know, we'll take him at 14. Because yeah, it's kind of, let's have a, let's have it's a, kind of risk-free. Yeah, give it, give it a go. It's kind of a free pick. But yeah, to take him third, oh God, I would love to have seen what would happen around that at the time. And why he was taken third overall. I've never seen that before about his, like, his junior years and stuff and his OHL stuff. No, I, I never knew. Never knew. It's crazy, isn't it? That said, Dan, he's still still second in his draft year for NHL points. <laughs> is he really? Yeah, yeah, three hundred. Well, I think he's not a bad player, is he? He's been no. perfectly fine. No, he's, he's... but for third overall, you expect better than just perfectly fine. I think that's the thing is it's always been expectations with him. Like he's never quite turned, yeah, that's blossomed into. Cause he, what he had thirty goals in his second season, I want to say. Second, yeah, third season, third season, no, fourth season. Yeah, yeah. Th- okay. <laughs> Has he ever <laughs> scored thirty goals? That's the question. Yeah, he's just never quite turned into what you'd want him to be. But he's never been a bad player. I know. It, I know it's not a good measure of people's ability, and it is terrible. It's a terrible thing. But when it's for comedy, I'll use it all the time. His career, he's a minus sixty on the ice. <laughs> sixty. Jesus Christ. <laughs> minus sixty. And that's that's always been the thing about him. Like, oh, he can't play defense. That's why he can't play center. He doesn't know how to play in his own end of the ice. Maybe maybe, maybe you'd <clears> have known that if he'd have played any games before you drafted him. <laughs> maybe if the year before the draft, you might have seen him play one, maybe maybe three games. Maybe you would have had an idea. I love the idea of a, of a Canadian scout not even going to those two games. <laughs> so, what does it matter? Or he puts in the wrong tape. He puts in the tape from the year before. This guy's amazing. <laughs> I can't believe no one's picking him up. Absolutely tearing it up. Yeah. What do you mean he's got 80 oh, points? Yeah. I thought he'd only scored, played two games. Yeah, that's, oh, that's brilliant. There's another interesting one, just on a complete tangent. You know they do like um, like the central scouting and like the, the, the predictions and stuff, oh, yeah. like the top ranks before the drafts. Yeah. Um, you know, Andre, Andre Kasher, the Ducks player. Yeah. He was yeah. he was the number ten, I think, ranked European skater in his draft year, which I want to say was two thousand and fourteen, and he didn't get drafted until the seventh round. 
Jesus. And I, I, I've, I've, I've done some some sort of light digging online before and found out why. But that, that intrigues me to no end. Like obviously those those aren't strict predictors of, of where scouts actually rank these players or anything. But to be tenth on the NHL Central Scouting list and not be drafted into a seventh round, he was picked in the two hundreds. That just fascinates me. Yeah, why? Why did he go that low? No idea. No idea whatsoever. Maybe because I couldn't pronounce his last name or something. <laughs> Loads of people tried to draft him. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. We're gonna pick. Uh, we're gonna pick Case. We're picking Case. Yeah, Case definitely. We're gonna take on the phone. We're taking Case. Okay. The Buffalo Sabres with the seventeenth <laughs> pick. The Buffalo sick Jim Case. For, no, no. Ah, oh, Jesus Casey Christ. Casey <laughs> Yeah. How do you say his goddamn name? Oh, it's Casher. Oh shit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll take him now. Shouldn't look that before, really. Yeah. Oh, there we go. A little bonus wormhole. That was fantastic. There you go. Let's move on. A little wrinkle with... God, this is going to start off somewhere, let me tell you. With the coronavirus. <laughs> okay. Is that... Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. Companies in China are being impacted by this. Obviously, not just local population and people. It's companies as well. And it is a strange little wrinkle that China produces a lot of hockey sticks for companies. And there are now issues with getting hockey sticks into the into Canada and America because obviously they can't import them. And players have said that they're having to be careful to try and not break sticks because normally there's just like a limitless supply of hockey sticks going around and now there isn't. And I think it's amazing that something like this might actually impact the game because if, just think, right, this shows no signs of slowing down. And I mean, it's, it's getting worse, kind of it looks like at the moment. And I just love the idea that Maybe in practice now, players having to use old sticks or they're rummaging around in their parents' basement looking for like their their peewee sticks and their midget sticks and all this kind of stuff. Well, like that thing with, um, do you hear about Mike Green all those years ago? The Mike Green story about the, the type of stick that he liked? No, what was that? So there was this one one type of stick, I think it was like the Eastern Stealth something, it was some, some particular model of stick that Mike Green really, really liked. And uh, it went out of went out of production. So when he was getting when he found out it was uh, going out of production, he sent out like a like a request. He was like buying them all up, like buying them off eBay, this that and the other. And it got to the point where <laughs> fans were bringing back sticks he had signed and given to them. No way! In exchange for new ones of like the models that he doesn't like. Isn't that crazy? Fantastic! That is fantastic. Yeah, that's what's going to be happening. Yeah, oh, definitely. It's gonna be like it's gonna be like in the uh, in the war when Churchill said like, "Bring all your pots and pans. We need to melt them all down. Something bullets and weapons and that kind of thing. Bring any sticks back, any sticks won in competitions, any sticks thrown over the glass, anything. We need them. We're, de- we're desperate." Yeah, it's exactly the same as World War Two. I'd say. I think you're right there. <clears throat> exactly. And you know what? Any company in its right mind now will start manufacturing sticks by the bucket load in America or Canada and branding them as so. And they should say something on the box like, I don't know, they should call the sticks like virus free or something like that. <laughs> like, that just feels a little bit xenophobic because <laughs> it's, it's not like they can't buy them from China because they're going to be infected. Well, but they might be. That's the problem, isn't it? You don't know. I, th- I thought the point was like it's stopping production because people are ill. Well, that is the main thing. But I also I also heard that because they're not completely sure how the virus is spreading, they yeah. can't accept things in from other countries in case the virus is somehow contained or something like that. Yeah, that makes like sense. A, so, <laughs> someone in China's packing sticks into a box just before they close it. <laughs> Closed. Coughing, <laughs> coughing all over him. Hasn't washed her hands properly. Yeah. Then if someone opens it, like the, the equipment guy opens it in like Winnipeg and it's just like a, a cloud of green gas <laughs> that's in his face. Like, <laughs> Patch your liner goes out okay. four to six weeks with coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love the idea of Dude. like equipment managers going out to Canadian Tire and stuff like that, just buying all the sticks. And now we need official <laughs> league business. Yeah. They don't even buy them. You have to give us. To, you have to give these to us. It's a national emergency. <laughs> Flashes an NHL lanyard. It's like there you go. I'll be taking these. <laughs> like it's a police badge or something. I need to commandeer these sticks. <laughs> <laughs> the Rangers are in town, don't you know? It looks like Will that in the end. Nobody has won the Shea Weber PK Subban trade. <laughs> as 
Is, <laughs> does does a player get an injured count as you losing a trade? <laughs> well, I think I think what's what's kind of happening now is is PK is kind of struggling now with his injuries. Shea Webber is out four to six weeks with an ankle injury, which Nick Kiprios reported as that basically he's having both his legs amputated at one point, which <laughs> was he was then shot down quite quickly I by, he was the, uh, by the Montreal blades, media. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I just think it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, like at the time, Nashville early on, Nashville won the trade because obviously PK was how did that Stanley Cup finish four two to Pittsburgh? They were close to you know he was close to getting a cut, but. It just seems like now that it's just going to fizzle out, and we're never going to—I don't know. It's it, its kind of sad that that blockbuster trade has kind of ended up to this. Because yeah. to me, okay, Shea Weber's only out four to six weeks, but it's clear now that okay, he's now having more and more and more problems. Yeah, there's, and like you said, like PK is already having problems on you know on his own. There's more talk of Shea Weber like retiring or or whatever or LTIRing and stuff like that than. Before, so it's yeah, it's not a good situation for for Weber or the Canadians, and to go or Nashville if he retires. Oh my god! Oh, I, because I that hope, recapture penalty. I hope he retires. Oh I've never wanted anything more <laughs> than for the Predators to be on the on the hook for was it twenty four point seven million or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say yeah, it's about twenty five million. Oh my oh, god! Oh, that'd be so good, so 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 good. Oh, you'd have to just jettison players. At least you'd have a shitload of picks to kind of start rebuilding, but... I think, yeah, to an extent, depending on who you're getting rid of, there'd be some sort of bidding war, but yeah, you wouldn't get full market value. You'd, you'd definitely no, be looking it's supply, at it. Supply and demand, Philip Forsberg for a third. I'll take it or leave it. Well, okay, heard, I'll yeah. take it. Do you, do, you wanna, do you wanna take the... Pen- what, I don't know what the penalties are in the NHL for going over the cap. Yeah, I don't know. I've, I've no idea. I wonder if there's just going to be an element of, yeah, whatever. Don't care. We'll, we'll just carry on as as is. Is it fines? I know. Um, I know in things like baseball and stuff like that, if you start to go over, you start to get hit with pick penalties. So you start losing draft oh, picks, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. But let's have a look. There's generally no way to go over the cap. The league will void any transactions that takes the team over the salary cap. So I guess what would happen is the league would just step in and just start making deals for the team if they said, "Well, there's nothing we can do. Sorry about it." I don't know how that would shake out then. No, it happened to the Hawks, didn't it, this season? You'd have to play with a shortened roster, wouldn't you? But then you'd still have... It's not like... So the, <laughs> the Preds will have like a 14-man roster. <laughs> but it, how, how do you decide which... I suppose the Preds will just have to decide which players are a void from... Like, yeah, what what happens? Cause, well, cause, <clears> because <throat> the, like the say, Hawks didn't have enough room to you... call somebody up. It's not like they had too many players. It's not like they called up seven players and they had too many. True. Yeah, true. I see what you're saying. So it's... Yeah, it's a weird one. It's probably it's not going to happen though because I reckon if if they get to that stage, like yeah, Joe would be like, yeah, all right, it's a dumb rule. It's all right. We we won't. Do you know why it wouldn't happen? Is it Shea Weber's a good hockey man? He wouldn't he wouldn't do that to a team. He wouldn't do that to the Preds, would he? He'd be he'd be walking around like the bloody Terminator, forty <laughs> percent exactly. Iron Man, and then uh, be very ineffective, but still honouring his contract. And isn't it until twenty twenty six? Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, definitely, definitely not a good situation, unless you're a fan, which I am. <coughs> so it's great. I love it. Yeah, I tell you, editing this show is gonna be a fucking piece of work this week. Jeez, oh Louise, I feel for you. I really do. Just leave them all in. <laughs> oh yeah. Last thing this week, man versus eight year old. Hey, Will, you schmuck! You're gonna get roasted by an eight year old, you fool. Go on. How, how am I doing? How am I looking, doctor? You you stood pat last week. Still only eight only eight points behind. O- only so, that's good. Only a minus eight. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. There's still plenty of time to go. How long is it to go actually? How many games are we up to? Fifty eight. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so twenty four games geez, left. Louise. You're gonna need to start putting out some uh, some multi point multi point games. Well, I'm afraid. I, I I think I will. I think I definitely need to. All right. Here's this week's uh, Sabres Blue Jackets. Uh, Blue Jackets. Without a doubt. Okay, even though Cam Atkinson and Seth Jones are both out. Interesting. Oh, don't, okay. don't hit me with the facts. Sorry, Avalanche Capitals. Capitals. Ooh, 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 yeah, yeah. For first answer. Okay, Blues Preds. Blues, got to be. Flames Blackhawks. <laughs> Flames? <laughs> I don't like it when and you give me the seemingly obvious ones. Yeah, they're the worst ones. And Canucks Ducks. 
again, Canucks, but we will we will see. We will see. Okay. Just for because I forgot I forgot in the past few weeks. Just for clarity, uh, George has gone Sabers, Caps, Preds, Blackhawks, and Canucks. So there we go. All right, there we go. Thank you for listening, everybody. Will any last words? Stay safe out there. Let's get out of here. We're both ill as fuck. We'll talk to you later, everyone. Peace. Thank you.